So far, I've given you an overview of what Spring is and, and Spring Boot kind of talked architecturally about the various elements, things like client and controller and service and model and talked a teeny weeny bit about dependency injection and so on and inversion of control. But what I want to do next is just give a quick overview of some of the key design patterns that help to guide the architecture of Spring and Spring Boot. And this is very important topic. So does it, what are design patterns? Design patterns are basically common solutions to problems that occur frequently within a particular context. And uh, for those of you who've taken the CS3251 course here, you probably have been exposed, hopefully have been exposed to some of the basic patterns that you would find in the so-called Gang of Four book, the book that talks about things like bridge and factory method and visitor and state and all those other fun patterns that you hopefully got exposed to in that class. And those are classic patterns for how you organize and structure software components in an object-oriented environment or other things that are similar to object-oriented environments. And knowledge of these patterns is incredibly valuable. And they're incredibly valuable because what they do is they codify good expertise that was learned through painful trial and error over a long period of time by experts. And when the experts finally stood back from what they did and they documented what they did, other people can learn from them and do a better job of building their own software. And patterns are by no means limited to software. Patterns are things you find throughout many other aspects of life. So uh, anybody here ever taken you know, music lessons, or anybody here ever done martial arts, or anybody here ever done ballroom dancing, you know, or, or sports, right? All of those different domains end up with patterns that you practice until they become second nature. So if you take martial arts, you start off by doing, you know, clock blocks and punches and kicks, and you practice those over and over and over again. And once you get the basic movement down, you start to string punches, blocks, and kicks into things called katas. And once you get to a certain level, you know, you can fight four hooded ninjas on a bridge with a bow staff if you reach a certain level of proficiency with your knowledge of the martial arts patterns. Same thing is true with music. When you start out learning guitar or piano or whatever instrument you start with, violin, you typically start by learning scales. And maybe if you're doing guitar, you learn chords, or piano, you learn arpeggios, or whatever you do. And then you start to learn, like, chord progressions. So there's different ways of arranging music. So it goes in a certain way. And as you get to be better at that, those things become effortless because you've learned the basic patterns of music. And, you know, we could look at chess, we could look at dancing, it's all the same kind of thing. So software patterns are really nothing more than just trying to codify best practices and think about them in a systematic way. And like everything else in life, you know, you can get carried away with it. But, um, uh, and, and just because, you know, just because you're really good at playing scales doesn't mean you're going to be a great musician because there's more to being a great musician than just playing scales. Same thing is true with software. There's more to being a good software developer than just knowing patterns. However, if you don't know the patterns, it's like if you don't know the scales, you're probably going to be at a disadvantage compared to other people who do know them if for no other reason that you can communicate with each other if you all speak a common language of design, which is what patterns are largely about. So we're going to talk about some of Spring Boot's design patterns, some patterns that influence the way that Spring Boot is designed. And probably the most important pattern is something called convention over configuration. And this is a pattern that Spring implements quite um, thoroughly, and that's really what drives the way that it works. And the idea here, and you'll see this as we start looking at examples, it, I'm just giving you kind of a preview of coming attractions. When we look at the examples, this will make a lot more sense. The goal is to make it possible to create production grade web applications by refining general reusable blueprints. And of course, these blueprints evolved typically organically by people building software, noticing things that were common, trying to find ways to factor out some common code and common behaviors, and then making it easier to be able to program by abstracting the way in which certain things are brought together and certain things are generated. So the word blueprint is a very important concept here. And the idea with software frameworks like Spring Boot is to use the convention over configuration pattern to decrease the number of decisions that developers who use the framework must make in order to build apps that work and work well without throwing 
flexibility out the window. So the idea here is not to have a one-size-fits-all solution that forces you into a Procrustean bed of inflexible design choices, but rather to give you some sensible defaults that you can then customize as you see fit if your application behavior doesn't fit with what you get right out of the box. So let's talk about some of these things. Uh, so one thing I kind of alluded to was the idea of reasonable defaults. So when you take a look at Spring, you'll see it makes a bunch of assumptions about the default behaviors. For example, it's going to assume you're using the HTTP protocol with the conventional bindings. And if you are happy with that, you can get it. But if you want to come along later and change certain things, like change the actual protocol that's used to send information back and forth from client to server, you can do that. You can go ahead and add additional adapters and so on in order to be able to change the way that the protocol bits are encoded and decoded, if, if you so desire. But the default gives you something that works out of the box, which is good. Another con concept is you only have to specify or program the unconventional bits. So whenever there's something that, that doesn't work the way that you'd expect out of the box, then you can come in and customize it. And very often, those customizations are done declaratively which means that you don't have to write a lot of code. You can focus most of your effort on the code that's going to do the business logic and all the other stuff that does the infrastructure logic is generated for you or linked for you. So examples of things that are generated for you or linked for you would be things that handle encoding and decoding of native or reference Java types into JSON, which is then used to send across in the body of an HTTP post request, for example, or get a response back from an HTTP response. And so all the stuff that, that comes out of the box will do that encoding for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about the encoding and decoding process. Likewise, there's other things in there that can control properties like how many threads are being used, what port numbers are being listened to, what type of database you're using, all the low-level details are all specified through properties that appear in various configuration files rather than things you have to program explicitly. So that makes life a lot easier. And so you get stuff out of the box that works reasonably with defaults. If you want to change some things, often what you change is just by tweaking these configuration parameters rather than having to go in and write a lot of new code. So that's, that's a nice thing. Um, some other stuff that, and these are all somewhat related to each other, Eliminate distractions. So there are certain properties that are just very difficult to, to reason about so, or to implement. One would be the logic for implementing a front-end API gateway in a microservice architecture. So in a microservice architecture, you have something called an API gateway, which is really the, the front-facing middle-tier server that takes requests that come in from clients, like a mobile device or a web browser or a console app or whatever. And that's what's exposed. And typically, you'd, you know, you'd have it at a host name and some port number like 8082 or whatever. And that's all you want to expose to clients. You just want to have them talk to those things, to that one place. And then in the back end, hidden from the clients will be all these microservices that could be running on lots of other computers, with different IP addresses or different host names, different port numbers, and so on and so forth. And all of those details are going to be hidden from you. The, those distractions are something you as a client developer never care about, never have to worry about. And in fact, as a server developer, Spring also provides some really cool discovery client capabilities where it'll actually automatically discover all the microservices that are running in a configuration and then arrange to auto-forward requests from the API gateway to the microservice without you having to write that code. And the way that that's specified is by using cool annotation-based mechanisms. And that's another theme that goes along with some of this stuff, like eliminate distractions. You don't have to write all the code that makes a given component have this ability to auto-discover its microservices. You simply have to annotate your code with the right annotations. We'll talk about what annotations look like in a second. And then the Spring framework does all the work behind the scenes to make it behave the way you want. And there's lots of other annotations that are going to work as well. For example, 
the mapping between an HTTP request message and an endpoint method that handles that request is also done through an annotation. So you don't have to write that code. The distraction of having to write the mapping between messages and method calls, or messages and objects and method calls on those objects, those things all disappear when you start to use Spring because it's hiding you those details from you. And then I guess, that, you know, kind of summarizing this stuff up, it reduces the number of decisions you have to make because what you get out of the box is usually close enough. And whenever you do need changes, there's ways to make those changes in very systematic and controlled ways. So that's a quick overview of some of the key design patterns in Spring Boot. Uh, again, there's lots more where this came from, to quote, uh, quote Napoleon Dynamite, but uh, we'll talk about that as we get a little further along. Any questions?